It is my pleasure to introduce Lal Karsenbai, Executive President of Emerson Automation Solutions. After nearly 25 years at Emerson in leadership roles around the world, Lal became the business leader for Emerson's automation business one year ago today in October of 2018. In fact, he was introduced here at Emerson Exchange. In this role, Lal is responsible for Emerson's strategies, investments, and innovations that help customers like us achieve top quartile performance in projects and operations. So please join me in welcoming Lal to the stage. Midu, great job, thank you, loved your energy. It's great to be here. Um, you know, I was thinking about this a year ago when I first got up to speak with you. Um, I was pretty nervous. I got up here, I was actually in the audience, you may recall, Michael, um, we, we did a uh, little bit of a skit around location awareness. I came up and there was a, a beeping sound. I walked up on stage shaking. And I'll tell you, a year later, I'm still nervous. It is overwhelming when I look out into this audience and the 2,600 people that are here today. I will say, and I'll repeat myself from a year ago, that 2,600 of the finest people on the planet walk through the doors today. That's our customers, it's our partners, and it's our employees. So I thank you for taking the time, for making the investment to be here with us today and this week. Thank you very much. I'd also like to thank the Emerson Exchange Board. I know you put in countless hours of work to make this week possible. How about a, a round of applause for the board? Thank you. Sorry, I was afraid to clap because I've got so much stuff hanging on me. I don't want any of it to, to fall off or click some button that changes a chart by mistake. Um, I'll tell you, uh, this week is truly one of my favorite weeks of the year. You know, we prepare and we think about what we're gonna say, we think about what the themes are that we wanna convey throughout the week, but I really enjoy the interactions and the opportunity that we all have to share our ideas, to learn from your peers, and to build relationships. I think we have a great week in store for you this week. As some of you know, and we've talked about, I took over as the leader for Automation Solutions a year ago, and it has been a big year. It has been a big year for our industry, has been a big year for our company, and it has been a big year for me personally. I've learned a lot. I've spent a large part of this year on the road. I've traveled around the world, met with you, many of our customers around the world, and visited with our global organizations. It's been a, a very interesting 12 months, to say the least. And one thing I learned is that each of you, each of your companies face unique challenges and opportunities, but you also have a lot of common objectives across the, across the world. You're all driven to understand how technology helps drive your organizations to meet your goals. What, that's what really makes Emerson Exchange very valuable. Throughout the week, you'll find opportunities to learn from each other. And who knows, perhaps the best opportunity will come from a peer outside of your industry. Together, we are taking on the industry's biggest challenges and opportunities. I continue to be impressed with the power of collaboration that we have as, 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 together as a team. I've seen firsthand the tight alignment and trust between Emerson and your organizations and how that can accelerate progress and deliver real value for all of us. So let's start perhaps this morning by looking at what is happening today across your industries. First, unconventional oil and gas producers. And boy, we spent a lot of time talking about unconventional oil and gas over the last 12 months. In North America specifically are facing takeaway capacity constraints, 
industry consolidation, and volatile oil and gas prices. So it's a challenging environment, and in an environment like this, they must continue to focus on reducing operating costs, optimizing asset performance, and improving workforce productivity. In the midstream oil and gas sector, pipeline operators are faced with increased upstream supply and downstream demand. They need to expand capacity through effective project execution while ensuring the existing infrastructure of pipelines and terminals operates reliably and safely. Refiners continue to optimize for light crude, while petrochemical companies are working to bring extra capacity online to meet that global demand. For all of downstream operators, safety and reliability are key priorities for best-in-class performance. One of the most exciting developments in the United States in the past few years has been the growth of liquefied natural gas. In fact, over 40% of additional liquefaction capacity in the next five years will be added in North America. But as you know, LNG is big around the world. Qatar, Mozambique are investing to meet the demand for clean energy while Asia and Europe are investing in the regasification terminals. In addition, shipbuilders around the world are busy adding the capacity necessary in, to transport this liquefied natural gas. Power companies are evolving their strategies and operations to manage a new mix of energy resources, including renewables. Pharmaceutical producers are exploring two big trends of continuous manufacturing and single-use approaches for biologics production. Industrial manufacturers such as packaging or automotive industries are constantly seeking greater flexibility to quickly respond to the evolving consumer needs. So each of these industries faces unique opportunities and challenges. As I advise my Emerson colleagues, focus on the things you can control, which include, for our industries, ensuring safe operations, increasing reliability, and optimizing production. As we all know, automation plays a big role in meeting those challenges. It helps global leaders like your companies thrive, even in turbulent times. That's why your roles and your attendance at Emerson Exchange this week are so important. Automation professionals in today's production environment have a direct impact on company performance. Now, I know you are all users of Emerson products and services, but I also know that about half of you are at Exchange for the first time. So let me tell you about some of the important innovations and investments that Emerson has made in the past couple of years to make us an even stronger partner. Last year, we announced Delta V V14, the largest release since the original Delta V. You'll be glad to know that the latest version of Delta V V14 is now available for download. Earlier this year, we also introduced the latest version of our Ovation control system for power and water. This includes enhancements to advanced control, cybersecurity, and analytics capabilities, to name a few. We also released new versions of Guardian, Plant, Plant Web Optics, and Plant Web Insight software. Our innovations in field instruments and valves include integrated digital isolation valves for safety applications, two wire Coriolis meters for easy installation and improved flow, a family of hygienic measurement instruments designed for food and beverage applications, and a new ultrasonic plastic joining set of technologies. But we're also working very hard on enabling innovation across our product development teams. This includes cybersecurity, Bluetooth, RFID, and QR codes. 
While our internal product development pipeline is very strong, we constantly look for technology and expertise that we can acquire. That would complement our portfolio of technologies and fully address your automation needs. So we've made several key acquisitions in the past couple of years. As a matter of fact, we made eight acquisitions this financial year. So let me spend a little bit of time on, on those. We significantly expanded our position as your main valve partner two years ago by acquiring the valves and controls business of Pantera. This year, we added to our final control elements for steam management and cryogenic valves for LNG to the portfolio. We also invested in corrosion and erosion detection for, to extend the leadership position we have in our ins measurement instrumentation. In the field of factory automation, the Aventix Smart Pneumatic Portfolio complements a strong ASCO fluid control solutions business. An area of growing importance for our customers is data management and analytics. We've been very active. We've been building a portfolio of industry-specific analytics and information management tools. One of our most strategic came a year ago, if you recall, the acquisition of the intelligent platforms business of General Electric. It was announced the second day of Emerson Exchange. This new business enables Emerson to address traditional PLC applications in hybrid and discrete industries, but also enables us to target process industry applications. Soon, we will add PLC control integrated with Delta V and Ovation. This will help you reduce the islands of automation in your facilities and reduce cybersecurity threats. This is a big step forward towards a fully integrated control platform across all of the applications in your facilities. And I'm very excited about this opportunity. Well, you can't really talk about technology today without talking about the cloud. It is estimated that more than $200 billion is now spent on cloud services and infrastructure. It is increasingly attractive for geographically dispersed operations like remote well pads. We recently acquired a company called ZI Solutions, a cloud-based SCADA solution business. This extends our leadership in delivering the digital oil field from sensors and controllers to communications infrastructure and software and deep industry expertise. These internal innovations combined with strategic acquisitions enable Emerson to be your solution provider across the broadest range of applications and industries. And while our technology portfolio has significantly increased, so have the services we offer for projects and ongoing operations. You know, in customer meetings I attend with your executives, I repeatedly hear how much they value collaboration and partnership. Through our services, we become an extension of your teams. Our project engineering, management, and execution resources have continued to grow globally. We have over 4,000 project personnel around the world. Many of them come with deep industry expertise. For instance, we have more than 700 life science specific project personnel. We have also created very recently a dedicated team for global LNG project management and execution. While executing projects is obviously important, effectively running your facilities is a top priority that lasts for decades. Our customer staffing is stretched thin. There's a need for increased local service and support for daily operations. Emerson has continued to invest in resources closest to where our customers need them. With nearly 4,000 service personnel and over 300 global service centers. Examples of two new service centers include the Permian Basin Solution and Service Center, as well as our Service and Solution Center in the Vaca Muerta region in Argentina. 
These centers enable Emerson to support customers with comprehensive service, education, and spare parts. So that's a quick update on the key areas we've been working on in order to support you better. Our ability to invest in these kinds of products and services is made possible by the trust that you place in us. We truly see this as a partnership for shared success. Okay, um, so for those of you who've spent time with me over the last year or so, you know I like to discuss, debate, important topics. So rather than using the next 30 minutes or so to give you only my perspective, I'll have a discussion about, I wanna have a discussion about one of the hottest topics in the, in, in the industry today, digital transformation. So if you were at Emerson Exchange a year ago, you may recall that we spent some time on this topic. Now, I realize that there's a lot of hype surrounding digital transformation and honestly, confusion. This morning, we're going to explore it further. We're gonna to try to add some clarity and make it actionable for each of you. In order to do that, I'd like to invite a couple of people who are actively engaged in this topic to join me on the stage this morning. The first person really requires no introduction, as many of you know him, Peter Zornio. Peter is our Chief Technology Officer. Peter guides the technology strategy across our entire portfolio. I'd also like to invite Stuart Harris to join me. Some of you may not know Stuart. Stuart has been part of Emerson for over 30 years and more recently leading strategic planning, marketing, and our internal digital strategy. As a matter of fact, this morning, we announced that Stuart will lead our new digital transformation business group, helping you through the digital transformation journey. Welcome, gentlemen. Hi, Lon. Peter, good morning. How are you? Hey, Lon. Stuart, how are you? Good. Great. Well, yeah, I'll take my jacket off now, huh? Yeah, all right. Yeah, you... Gonna get down to business. Get huh? down to business, that's serious stuff here. I've actually got a stack of questions. So we got a lot to go through together here. All right. Uh, do, you, do you have a stack of answers? Yes. <laughs> got a stack of answers. <laughs> okay. Well, Stuart, welcome. Congratulations. Thank you. I saw the announcement this morning, saw it on the wire. Thank you. There's a lot of buzz. Digital yep. transformation. Yep. So tell us, is this all talk? Is this real? What's going on? Well, there's definitely a lot of hype around digital transformation, and a lot of the discussion is focused on the technology. Um, if you do a Google, a Google search on the term digital transformation, you'll get 400 million results. And so with that comes a lot of confusion. But there is a huge opportunity around digital transformation. Um, the potential impact is significant, and some companies are making good progress. So how do you define uh, digital transformation, Stuart? How do you define it? Yeah, well in simple terms, it is smart, connected technology that's used to solve a problem. And it usually involves a behavioral work process change. Yeah. Okay, so I know you mm -hmm. guys accuse me of using analogies too much all the yeah. time, but I, I actually have a favorite one here where for all of our automation crowd, I think, you know, you think of just what you do in an automation loop where you have data, digital data, that's at an appropriate rate. You feed it into software algorithms that know how to interpret the data, and it takes action. It moves a valve or starts a pump. With digital transformation, I think it's still, it's that closing the loop of analyzing the data, applying the appropriate kind of software and analytics to take an action that's gonna make things better. So I like mm -hmm. to use the term, it's closing the loop in a lot of other new areas. So I, I hear you, so there's an important technology aspect but there's also a people aspect and an outcome-based business aspect as yep. well, Stuart. Yeah, yeah. We really do need to define digital transformation more by the outcome that we're trying to achieve than the technology that's behind it. Now, the technology decisions are important, but they need to be guided by the specific problem that we're trying to solve. And as you said, the people, is, the people aspect is also critical because transformation doesn't happen unless we have people engaged and the technology is adopted. So Peter, is this any different than what our automation customers have been doing for the past 25 years? I definitely believe it's more of an evolution than a revolution. 
Um, if you are familiar with our plant web digital ecosystem chart mm -hmm. that we use to, to talk about our solutions in this area a lot, we try to make that point by showing what we call the digital foundation, all the investments that the people in this room have made in smart sensors, automation systems, software applications as a digital foundation to build upon. Many of the technologies that are talked about today, models, uh, digital twins, all that technology are things that we've been doing for a while, approaches we're familiar with, but there's definitely new technology and new approaches. So uh, the cloud, as you already discussed, a lot of new sensor technology and new business models as well as like the connected service where you actually think of a third party mm -hmm. doing something for you. Yeah. So Stuart, where is our industry? Perhaps we can set the stage. Where is yeah. our industry? on the digital transformation journey? Yeah, well I think we're, we're at a very critical stage in the journey. We've got some companies that have a vision, but they're not sure quite where to get started and actually might be getting frustrated as a result because they're not seeing the kind of impact they, they hope for. We've got many companies that are doing pilots and the challenge there is then to take those and scale the pilots, but we've also got some companies that are seeing early benefits. And so I'll think it's critical that we connect vision and strategy with mm -hmm. the technology and standards and the business case and the practical applications. So clearly companies are making progress here. Can you describe some of the key characteristics of those that are having success? Yeah, I mean, we have hundreds of customers, many, many here, who are applying these technologies and are seeing a real business impact. And so if we look across that group and we think about some common themes, mm -hmm. the first is that strategy and the business case came first, not the technology. Um, they started with a very specific and focused problem to start with. They, they captured that ROI, documented that, and then scaled that application and looked to replicate it both across their own facility and also across the enterprise. So what are some examples of the types of problems that customers are solving? Yeah, you know, as we engage with customers, it's always amazing to me just how creative they are and how, you know, the, the vast array of solutions that, that people are, uh, and problems that people are solving, from reliability to safety, uh, production, energy and emissions. So corrosion monitoring, heat exchangers, pressure relief valves, uh, steam trap monitoring pumps, gas detection, I mean the list goes on. And we've got this, this um, broad portfolio of sensors, software and services. And the way we like to think about it is providing customers with the, the technologies and the solutions, known solutions to known problems. Okay. Uh, you know, I also think it's important when you read about digital transformation in the press, uh, a lot of the public media kind of press is around more enterprise level digital transformation mm -hmm. as well. So Stuart did a great job of doing what we talk about, operational analytics or applications mm -hmm. of the operational space, but of course a lot of the, the mainstream media is in retail or in a whole bunch of other areas where people are looking to to digital transform, even things that happen in our personal lives like sure. we all see with our smartphones every day. Mm -hmm. right. So, so contrast for me now, Stuart, those who are having problems with digital uh, transformation. Yeah, I think one common uh, theme there is those who try and take a big bang approach and try to tackle digital transformation mm -hmm. as, as one single thing. Um, second would be those who put the technology first. They start to invest in infrastructure, data lakes, analytics, but they're not even sure yet what the problem is that they're trying to solve. And so again, they get frustrated with that because they're not going after a very specific set of, mm -hmm. of problems or objectives. And you know, worse still, they might invest in the wrong technology and then get very frustrated because they haven't made that return on the investment. Yeah. Uh, I also see, I think, one of the biggest things that's easy to maybe underestimate is the work process impact and getting the people who actually have to take the action to be engaged and actually adopt whatever the new digital practice is and seeing it all the way through to embedding it in work practices. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's yeah. we really often underestimate that, uh, the change management piece of this. So are you advocating that companies should do pilots to prove success, to prove the benefits? Well, some people call them pilots, other people call them proof of concepts. Many people here probably just call mm -hmm. it problem solving. But what's important is not so much the terms, but having a focus, knowing what the metrics of success look like, and measuring performance against those, and then using that to justify the next investment. 
Okay, well, so I understand the advantages of the pilot, yep. but companies are looking for millions and millions of dollars sure. of a yep. return here. Right. So if you start small, how does that happen? How can you scale to those kinds of savings? Yeah, well, maybe we take an example. If you think about a single heat exchanger, uh, okay. maybe we apply pervasive sensing to improve the performance of that single heat exchanger and get a benefit of fifty to $100,000 per year. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now we scale that application across all the critical heat exchangers within that facility, and now that looks like a $2 million annual benefit. We scale that same single application across the enterprise, and now we've got $20 million in annual savings. So one success really can be that justification for, for bigger plans. It's about focusing, replicating, mm -hmm. and then realizing that value at scale. Yeah, you, you should always have the vision of where yeah. you want to end up. Uh, being Mr. Analogy again, I'll yep, say it's kind of like remodeling your house, right? You should have a vision of how the whole house is gonna look when you're done, but you have to live in that house while you're doing the remodel. So typically you, you do a room at a time, but all in concert to a, to a final plan mm -hmm. to get to where the, the full benefits are achieved. Okay. So we know budgets are tight. So how should customers think about budgeting for digital transformation? Yep. Well, the great thing with the approach that we've been talking about is that you can get started for fifty, hundred thousand dollars of investment, okay. and you know many customers can find that within their existing operating budgets. Generate a quick ROI, use the benefits to justify the next investment or the expansion of that. But I do think that it's important to understand what the budgeting process is uh, for our customers. Uh, and, and understand how to get ahead of that, because otherwise you're always just chasing the, mm -hmm. the, the funds that are within that operating budget. So, and also, you know, many companies are now starting to put budgets aside for these digital, pro, uh, digital transformation initiatives. And so, again, understanding where they are in the organization, who owns those purse strings, and connecting initiatives to that. So, Stuart, what's the real urgency, though? I mean, our customers are running their operations safely. Right. They're producing quality product. What's the call here? Yeah, well, the benchmarking that we've done across many industries shows that there's a significant gap between the top quartile performers and the industry averages. So to give a few examples, the top quartile performers enjoy two weeks of additional uptime mm -hmm. each year. They have half the maintenance time and 30% fewer safety incidents. So the opportunities are significant. Now, we're all under pressure to improve performance and digital transformation really does represent an opportunity, and it can be a competitive advantage for those who are successful with it. That's a very, very good point. So let me turn to you, Peter. Uh, what are the hot technology topics in digital transformation? Well, I think uh, one of the ones, like they said in the old movie, The Graduate, for those of you that are old enough to remember it, is you know it's analytics, 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 right? So that's a, a very hot topic. That focus has led to, I think, uh, increased emphasis on getting a data infrastructure in place. Mm -hmm. uh, people assume that you know the data is readily available to do analytics on. That's often actually not the case, and having a good uh, infrastructure for that. A lot of excitement about augmented reality and virtual reality technologies, and of course. Pervasive sensing, you know, new sensor technology, uh, the ability to get more data with that. Underpinning all of this, though, of course, is cybersecurity, right? right? So cybersecurity is a, an ever-present thing that we always have to be aware of. So, Peter, obviously, we hear a lot about analytics, machine learning, artificial intelligence. Can you help us break that down a little bit more? Sure, if you think about the control loop example I used earlier, right, and, and you just think very simply about, you know, C or getting the data, mm -hmm. decide or figuring out what's going on, and then taking an action, which is the most important thing. Analytics is that top middle part. It's that decide, however you choose to do it. Uh, there's multiple different technologies. You just named a couple of them that can be used. Uh, and again, this could be either at operational kind of applications like Stuart talked about, or that same approach can be used in retail as we hear about all the time, or just trying to figure out you know, who your best supplier was in your company. So uh, people are very excited about the idea of, of applying analytics on, on their data to extract knowledge and the right thing to do next. Are there new technologies being applied to analytics? Yeah, yeah. so you know, if you look at our industry for a long time, uh, we've used what I will call principles-based analytics, where we actually know the chemistry, the thermodynamics, the mechanical 
rules or interactions that are going on and we've built models and we've used those to decide what's going on, but we've also used data-driven analytics. Mm -hmm. uh, APC, for instance, you know, builds a data-driven model that advanced process control then uses. That's where all of the real up latest hype and attention has mm -hmm. been with some of these new techniques like machine learning and deep learning leading to AI, where the idea is that the model can be driven just from the data without knowing the mechanisms of what's happening. Right. So it seems to me, Peter, that analytics and the cloud are intertwined today as we think about it. Yeah. Is the cloud the natural spot for analytics today? That is exactly what the cloud providers would want you to think. Um, and certainly the cloud providers have invested a lot in tools and technology up there to make it happen. And the cloud has an advantage of being able to pull you know, data sources together from a lot of different places. But we believe that really analytics are best done where it makes sense. And a lot of times that's closest to where the data itself is being generated. Uh, even from a technology point of view, this sometimes is discussed as like an, an edge computing versus cloud computing kind of debate, you hear it phrased. But, but a great example is if you're diagnosing you know, equipment where we have a lot of those more principles-based kind of mo models, it's better to do that right there at the equipment where the person responsible for the asset is running the analytics in the application and then can take the action, the most important part, based on the output. Yeah, okay. Peter, also those equipment-focused analytics, I think are um, a place where a lot of people can see the business case and is a very good place to get started okay. as well. Okay, so Peter, we did a lot of diagnostics in the original version of Plant Web. Yeah. Um, is it fair to relate that to what's going on today in today's analytics space? Uh, absolutely. I mean, we like to think we were digital transformation before digital transformation was cool, right? Right. And uh, many of the concepts in Plant Web, the intelligent devices, the diagnostics, all of that are, are still concepts that are part of today's digital mm -hmm. transformation. Yeah, in fact, Lord, when we talk to our customers about digital transformation and starting on that journey, yep. the smart devices that they install, the AMS software, for example, that is the starting yep. point for their, their journey. Interesting. Very interesting. So data integration, can we talk a little bit about that? And where the new acquisition of ICE solutions, for example, comes in play, can you? Sure, I, you know, I mentioned earlier that all this focus on analytics has driven, I think, a renewed awareness and interest in a data integration infrastructure. Uh, the guys that we just acquired, the iSolutions, those were a group of people who were dedicated to the problem of how they integrate data together uh, whether it's data from a DCS uh, historian, cloud, ERP systems. So I think it's very timely that we have that team on board now because that's a, a big issue uh, mm -hmm. for a lot of our customers as they look at analytics. Yeah. Peter, I think the other thing about analytics, as you mentioned earlier, it's, it's one thing to do the analytics. It's also to make sure that we get it into the hands of the people who can use it. Yes. So from personal experience, I, I, have, uh, I can relate to sensor technology. Uh, Peter, what's going on in that area? Well, there's, you know, certainly uh, corrosion, which you already mentioned in your talk is a, is a hot topic, especially mm -hmm. in the refining industry. Mm -hmm. uh, we introduced a location awareness solution at the exchange last year that's in field trials right now. Huge response to that. People are very interested in, in that technology. Uh, we also have a new vibration transmitter right. that, we, that we've brought out. So there's a, a lot of new things happening in the sensor space as we in, will be showing everybody at the exhibition floor and at the various roadmaps here at the exchange. Yeah. Okay. And, and the data integration may be going back to that. So we've got the sensing, you've got, we already established that data is key and then bringing it all together. Right, so it that. always starts with the data. It doesn't matter which one of the technologies you use for analytics, mm -hmm. like some of the ones I talked earlier. You need data to, to do it on. Um, having more sensing technology, especially unique technologies such as the acoustic, the corrosion, the vibration, uh, always helps no matter which analytics approach you're using because it gives you more certainty into what the, the answer is that you're gonna derive and a lot of the data-driven analytics are assuming that you can figure out the answer based on just the data you have, but again, more sensors means you get better results. Okay. Now, you said early in your, in, in your comments, Peter, cyber, cyber, cyber. 
So we've got data. Now, how's cybersecurity impacting this, this journey? Yeah, so the, uh, I'm not sure which one is more prevalent, the analytics, 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 or the cyber, <laughs> cyber, cyber. Um, and cybersecurity, of course, is extremely important to everyone here, whether or not they're doing digital transformation or you know, traditional, more automation type applications. Uh, cybersecurity is, is an ever-present thing to be focused on as the number of threats continue to go up and we see incidents, everyone. I can't say that, you know, no one would say it, it speeds things up. Mm -hmm. It's one of those things that you just have to do. It's like safety. You, nobody wants to be the victim of a, of a cyber attack. Um, as we look at the data integration, it's really highlighted the issue because we see IT and maybe some other corporate level folks wanting more access to the operational systems, what we call OT now, um, and the OT folks are, well, rightly concerned about how many things are, are being, uh, how many people are coming after their data and whether that will open up the door for more threats. So we've done a lot to get new cyber certifications. We have a whole set of uh, architectures, standard reference designs for secure connection of data. Mm -hmm. And we just opened a new lab, as you know, to do our, our own cybersecurity yeah. testing. I know yes, I was there. It was a yeah. lot of fun. I yeah. was there with Stuart and Stuart Jamie was, yep. and Sabi. It was yeah. phenomenal. It was very impressive to see you already, very just in so. a very short amount of time, how much penetration testing they've done across a whole variety of our, our products. Um, and uh, making an impact yeah, already, yep. Okay, so can I uh, go to one last topic here? Sure. So we've talked about technology, we've spoken about the business case. Can we talk about people? Yeah. And that, that investment that's required. It's absolutely critical. Uh, we need to invest in the people just as much as in the technology when we think about digital transformation because transformation or change mm -hmm. doesn't happen unless it's fully embraced by people and we change those work practices, change the behaviors. Mm -hmm. We just summarize it a lot of times by saying, look, nothing changes until somebody does something different, mm. right? It's pretty simple fact, but it's true. So getting that down to the work process is critical. It is. So as we think about customer organizations, who owns digital transformation, Stuart? Well, we see the ownership coming from, and the leadership coming from many different places in the organization, different functions. Okay. But there are, there are several things that are consistent that we see. The first is that there is executive support behind the initiative. The second is that IT is engaged. They help with bringing the technology standards and particularly with helping to scale the solutions across the facility and especially across the enterprise. But most importantly of all, we see engagement by the operations okay. folks, because these are the people who have the deep domain, uh, the, the deep domain expertise and really understand what the problems are, what the feasibility of solving those are, and what the technologies that are needed are. Yeah, I think another organization that maybe you didn't mention that I've worked with a number of customers that they have now is, is they, are, they form teams from central engineering right. kind of folks, yep. like uh, yep. people that maybe came out of the operations world or now more in a corporate engineering role and are, are good to connect the corporate kind of functions, the IT world together with exactly. some of those operations mm -hmm. folks. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. So a year ago, if you recall, we spent a lot of time speaking about the IT OT relationship. Yeah. How has that evolved, Stuart? Well, I think it's evolved a lot. We see that it's evolved a lot. Um, just in the past year, mm -hmm. there's a much increased recognition of the contribution that each of those functional groups can bring to this conversation. We're also seeing new roles get created inside of our customer organizations. Things like an IT OT architect, uh, whose jobs it is specifically to connect uh, different parts of the organization. Mm -hmm. The cybersecurity thing I talked yes. about earlier is really driving a lot of this ITOT collaboration yeah. because of that need for that integrated data infrastructure. Right. Right. It's interesting, but we also, the traditional perspective is that IT, engineering, operations all speak a different language. Right. So who's doing the translating? Yeah. Well, uh, we do need people that speak a common language, but rather than thinking about them as translators, I think about them as bridges. Okay. Um, these are people who can connect the priority opportunities to the digital transformation programs. And what that does is it gives the digital transformation initiative a real sense of purpose because it's focused on a real operational problem. 
Um, but it also gives those folks who are trying to solve the problems a connection to the funds and the resources in the organization. So we need people who can connect and align the stakeholders. Yeah, no, it's interesting. You know, there's so many, it requires cross organization yep. engagement yes. here to really be yep. successful. And companies need people with these new skills to, to have a deeper understanding of what digital transformation is and, and the journey they're on. Yeah. So how are companies doing this? How are yeah. they going about getting their people ready? Yeah. Well, we see a variety of different approaches. Uh, some customers are creating academies or formal training programs mm -hmm. to do this, Lol. Um, they're taking some of the highest potential people from their operations and specifically mm -hmm. training them on some of the technologies we're talking about here, things like analytics. And we see the emergence of this idea of the, the citizen data scientist. And this is somebody who has that deep understanding of the operations, but they also understand analytics and they understand the power of putting those two things together to really drive uh, an impact in the business. Mm -hmm. You know, no matter what background those people come from, I see something common in all of them in that they're passionate change agents, yeah. right? Yes. We're talking about transformation. So it takes a, a personality and someone who really is committed and driven to doing things new and better in different yeah, way. Right. And so Stuart, how is Emerson helping customers get uh, their current and future generations to have that skill set required for digital transformation? Yeah. Well, Lol, of course, we offer educational services on these right. technologies, but we also actively work with over 350 educational institutions around the world. And together with them, we provide technology, we provide support on the curriculum development. In fact, uh, one great example is the San Jacinto College mm -hmm. in Pasadena, Texas, where, now this is close to the Houston Ship Channel, mm -hmm. and they uh, train thousands of students each year and provide the talent to around 130 plants in that region wow. specifically. So we have a video to, to see a little more oh. about their program. Okay. So let's watch. We're blessed to have 132 petrochemical plants very close to our college. We have over $60 billion of new capital being spent locally. So there's a lot of workforce growth, so really around that growth. Also retirements, we have baby boomers exiting, so there's a lot of opportunities there. A petrochemical plant today looks a lot different than it did a decade ago. Digital transformation is changing the nature of work around the world, and schools like San Jacinto are helping enable that workforce to meet that need. We have students that um, have been out in the industry and have all the mechanical skills, but maybe not so much the technology skills. We offer five degrees, one in process, instrument, electrical, quality, and safety. We have simulation technology, new control room, new glycol process unit. So over the last two years, we've been working with Emerson on the performance learning platforms. We see this being a huge tool for incumbent workers. This is a unique opportunity for Emerson to partner with higher ed at every level because not only does Emerson want our customers to be successful and have the best and brightest trained individuals to enable their success in their facilities, but Emerson also needs this workforce. Success is measured in, in a number of different ways. One of our um, key success factors is, are these students successful in getting a job? And uh, our uh, employment is 94%, so we feel very good about placement. And we continue to work with industry to continue to up our curriculum so that it meets their needs. It, it's awesome to hear students that, that come out of this program that what they've learned is exactly what they're seeing out in the plants. So what we wanted to make sure is that our student, when they graduate here, they have all the skills that those employers want. That's a beautiful college, yeah. beautiful college. I, I haven't visited uh, San Jacinto, but I did have the opportunity this July to visit the River Parishes yeah. Community College yep. in Gonzales, Louisiana, and I was very impressed with the capabilities. Yeah. Thank you, thanks for sharing that. Um, so let's turn the page a little bit and talk about the digital customer experience. Okay. So how Emerson interacts with our customers yep. through this digital journey. Yeah. Well, we think of the activities that our customers do in five areas. Five, five categories. Learn, when they're trying to learn about new solutions or solve a problem. Specify, procure, install, and operate. And over the last five years, we've built a rich set of capabilities, engineering tools, e-commerce, 
service tools, and also installed base tools, mm -hmm. thinking about all of those five phases and how do we connect them together so using digital tools. Can you give me a couple examples, Stuart, of those capabilities? Yeah. Um, let's think about something uh, sizing and selecting a field device, a pressure okay. transmitter, for example. The, if it's a project, the customer could share the engineering information with us digitally. We can bring that into the online engineering tools where we do the sizing and the selection. And throughout that whole process, Emerson can be collaborating with the customer online to make sure that we select the best technology for the application. From there, they could even go on and procure that device online if they chose to. Another example would be, say, a walk down. Okay. Um, we, we very often do walk downs in advance of a turnaround for customers. We inventory the assets, we take note of the health, um, and again, we can bring that information securely into an online environment that Emerson and the customer can, a can access together. We can go through the prioritization process so that when it comes time for the turnaround, we, ha we know exactly where to focus and what the priorities should be. Mm. And again, you know, it, it, it's all collaboratively that we do that work. Yeah. Yeah. Stuart, you mentioned the word collaborating. Yeah. Can you give me some examples of what you mean by that? Yeah. These tools facilitate collaboration by our customers between different functions. So in the case I gave you, you may have engineering, maintenance, and procurement all involved working together in these online tools. But as I said, it all, it's also an opportunity for Emerson to collaborate closely with customers. We've obviously got tremendous expertise inside of our salespeople, inside the service people, but these online tools facilitate that collaboration. At the end of the day, it makes Emerson easier to do business with, and for our customers, it makes it more efficient for, to, for them to do the kinds of day-to-day -day activities that they have to do. Also, going yeah. forward, we see an opportunity for collaboration with our own portfolio of field service products. So, yeah. you know, things like our handhelds, our, our uh, mm -hmm. clients that we have for mobile devices, such as Delta V Mobile and Plant Web Optics, the ability for those install base tools mm -hmm. to be integrated with those things as well. Right. Great. Yep. All right, so one, one final topic here. Yep. So Stuart, this morning we announced that we're creating a new business group within Emerson focused on digital transformation. Yep. I congratulate you. Thank you. You will be leading this. Thank you. Can you tell us a little bit about the objectives of the, of the organization what yeah. you, we're trying to achieve? Yeah, well, thanks, Lol. I mean, this is a terrific opportunity for me. Um, it's a terrific opportunity for Emerson and for our customers. Our experience is that customers are looking for a partner on this digital transformation journey. And we've just spent time here talking about the strengths that we have across technology, expertise, and services. We have the sensors, the secure communications, the software, the services, and this organization will bring all of that together. Mm -hmm. What that allows us to do is to partner with the customer to take them through this whole journey, whether it's developing the roadmap, implementing the technology, but really making sure that they realize the business impact from this. And so with this organizational change, we truly think that this makes us that best partner who can help the customer realize the, the, the promise of digital transformation and, and achieve that measurable business impact from it. Fantastic. Well, I wish you the best of luck and Thank you. you'll be very successful. Yeah. Thank you for your time this morning. Peter, as always, love hearing your perspectives. Thank you for your leadership around technology. And thank you for your time both this morning. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, all. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Well, that was fun. Um, so I've got, a, I've got just a few moments to close with you. But it's very clear from this conversation that digital transformation represents a, a huge opportunity. But to be successful, as we heard, it requires a solid business case, enabled by technology, and a clear focus on people. So I'd like to end the keynote today with a small challenge for each of you. One of the key points that I hope we made in the past half hour or so is that while many roles in the organization contribute to digital transformation, plant operations and engineering are amongst the most important. That's the very people in this room you know better than anyone what problems need to be solved. You know the impact that technology can make in your operations every day. There is so much opportunity for you to learn here this week. Challenge yourself to get the most value that you can. For example, 
when you go into a session, be bold in asking your questions. If a presenter talks about how they use a certain technology, ask them about the business case. How did they justify the investment? How did they quantify the impact of that investment? You could also ask about how they successfully implemented it. Who in their organization did they work with? Did they collaborate with IT? Are they working with their corporate digital teams to bring operational expertise to the company strategy? And as you visit the technology exhibits, think about how these innovations will help you solve problems in your facilities. Make the most of it. I really appreciate you joining us here in Nashville. I hope you have a great week. I'm excited about it. Make the most of it. Have fun. Thank you very much.